Hi, welcome to I am your coach. Uh, it's the last episode now after a little break we have been moving studios and well today I will talk with Aaron Meyer Chanu about the Second World War because actually the landing of the Allies in Normandy now repeats itself for the 75th time and many of the freedoms that we are now enjoying are related to their landing and the liberation of Europe from the Nazi regime. Hi Aaron. Hi Sasha. Thank you for coming. It's a very interesting topic, uh, the Second World War. It's a long time ago now, mm -hmm. and still it influences our life in many ways. What made you uh, start with the Second World War as, a, as an event? Well, I was studying it in college, and um, I was at the University of Texas in Austin. I grew up in Texas. And I was asked early on in my studies to do an oral history project with a veteran. And, um, you know, up until that point growing up, history had been basically a list of dates and events in a dusty textbook. I had no uh, notion that it had anything to do with me or my life, um, that I had any agency uh, in my own history. And when I sat with this uh, veteran and listened to his story and what had happened to him when he was in his early 20s, the same age I was at the time, um, I was just, I was really moved and struck by how those events of his life had influenced then the rest of his life. And I started to think, wow, what are the stories that I want to be looking back on later in my life and what are the choices I'll be making along the way? And um, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he in his early 20s was living a life so vastly different than my own and I couldn't help but, you know, just feel how him telling me his story, you know, history, this history of this his book, mm -hmm. all of a sudden became his story and his wife's story and, um, you know, his generation's story and I realized that I could stop anyone on the street of his generation and ask them what they had done during the war and a whole world came to life and that it wasn't something far removed, that it was something living and breathing alongside us and um, I just, yeah, became really passionately interested in it. Okay, and then you continued actually uh, digging into the the stories of the veterans? Yeah, um, so I... Um, I, I basically ended up changing my degree at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, I went to a special department where they allowed me kind of to design my own degree. And so I created an, um, a study program all based around World War II studies, uh, mainly in Europe and representation of the war in history. And I ended up doing my thesis on the Battle of the Bulge and representation of the battle over 50 years, how it had changed through popular media, through film, through fiction. Um, and so I spent several years with all of these veterans and I spent a lot of time in Normandy. I was there for the 50th anniversary um, and all the commemorations. And <clears throat> then I, um, I, I came, I had been in Europe for a year before starting college. And then I moved back um, and I did a master's in cultural anthropology and then I got pregnant and decided to stop and have my yeah. first child. <laughs> yes. And in the meantime, you had four childs altogether. Yes. Right? So I stopped my yeah. PhD. Um, you know, I had this professor who told me, she's like, why do a PhD? Why not write a book? And I thought, what a great idea. And I just took that idea and I put it really high up on a shelf where no one could reach it. Not even me. And I... Um, I had four kids over the course of, I guess, um, 11, 12 years. And with my family, we would continue to visit Normandy. We loved the beaches there mm. and we didn't always go to World War II sites, but you know, every now and then we'd see something or go see something. And about five years ago, my eldest daughter was old enough to kind of climb down off a tank and go, mom, what's this about? And I thought, yeah, hmm, what do I want my children to know about this moment in history? Yeah. It, but more importantly, I kept wondering, you know, what difference is going to make in their lives that they do know about this. So then I had to turn the question on myself and say, well, what did I learn in my early 20s and how over, you know, 20 years time, I had the, the ability to take a step back and look at, well, how did the influence of those veterans and their stories 
in my early 20s influence the next 20 years of my life and the decisions and choices yeah. I've made. And so your book, uh, D-Day Lessons for Today, actually is based on this reflection that you had uh, yeah. about how the stories of the veterans changed your life and your decision making and, and all the little things that you did now or big things that you did in yeah. your life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 uh, it's funny, when I first started the project, well, so, so I didn't necessarily have the idea of doing a book right away. Um, I wanted to answer this question for my daughter. I wanted, I, I wanted to kind of answer it for myself because Normandy was still a very um, significant and special place for me. And I knew that. And I knew that this time with these veterans early in my life had changed things, but I hadn't consciously identified them. And mm -hmm. so I started kind of going back to my bookshelf and looking at things and one day the idea of writing a book, you know, yeah. it was way up on the shelf, it fell down and hit me on the head. And I was like, oh, can I write a book about D-Day? I don't know. And how do I do that? And why me? Because, you know, I wasn't there and I wasn't a Pulitzer Prize journalist. Um, and I thought, okay, what's something, what's a different angle that yeah. I can take? Yeah. And so this idea of, of uh, yeah, what can we learn from this and, and, so much more of what difference does it make? How can it help us today? Yeah. You also describe on, in several parts of the book how your children influenced a little bit that you write that you wrote the book at all and also mm -hmm. what kind of book you wrote. Mm -hmm. And I remember this scene where your son and you go to the cemetery, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere in northern mm -hmm. France, and he sees and he says to you, I, I found myself, I'm dead, and all my friends are dead. He's yeah. lying too. I found that very profound. Yeah, it was. It was a very surprising moment because he had, well, he had found his name. He said, Mom, I feel like I should be dead. You know, I, I found my name on a, on a tombstone. And then I found the names of all my friends. And um, you always ask that question. <laughs> I've told this story so many times, it still gets me yeah. emotional. Um, you know, and so we went and we found the tombstone and we sat down and, you know, he has a name that he doesn't find on keychains and souvenir mugs. Yeah. So he was really surprised. And of course, so was I. And, um, you know, we sat there and I said, look, um, you know, you're not supposed to be dead, but it's because of this soldier and because of his friends and their lives that they sacrifice that we can live the lives that we have today. And um so it's important to to understand that and be grateful for that um and up until that point i always felt really guilty going to cemeteries mm -hmm. or even being with the veterans because i always thought how could i ever possibly repay um what they did mm -hmm. and and what can i do with my life to ever feel like somehow to show my gratitude or do something that is similar valuable to what they yeah somehow yeah doing. and so it was it was always a very heavy kind of oppressive feeling when i would go to cemeteries and as i was sitting there with my son i realized as a mother i would give anything for my son to be happy to pursue things in life that make him feel alive that uh, you know that he's passionate about because i truly believe that when we are doing the things that make us feel alive, well, by doing the things we, we that make us feel alive, we contribute the most to the lives of others. And so I realized there that the best way to honor those lives that were sacrificed was to live our own and to, to pursue the things that we love to do and that are meaningful to us and, and may give us a purpose, a sense of purpose mm. in life. And so I no longer felt, I felt like I know now how to honor the sacrifices that were made and, 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 and show my gratitude is by living my life to its fullest. And, and, and the best way to show my children how to do that was then to pursue my own personal desires because that day, you know, my son didn't want to go to the cemetery, which is what I wanted to do he wanted to go play on the beach and I was feeling torn between the two. And I realized, no, it's important that I show my children that I'm pursuing the things that are important to me because mm -hmm. that's how they will learn to pursue those yeah. things for themselves. And you were able to implement that in your, uh, uprising, the uprising of your children then to help them 
figure out what is important to them, what makes them feel alive. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, passion. they're they're not totally grown yet, and I think even even me, at, you know, at my age, I'm still always questioning that. So I think what I'm teaching my children is how to be aware and how to ask questions to themselves. So I say in the book, life isn't about finding the answers, it's about living through the questions. Mm. So, you know, we can constantly look at, you know, well, what makes us feel alive? What, what are the challenges we're facing? What is, how do we get to the next step? What is our current version of impossible? And, and working through that. Yeah. So always kind of fo refocusing, asking questions in a different way and being aware. Which brings us back pretty much to the content of, of your book. Mm -hmm. What were the biggest lessons that you took away from the veterans and uh, for yourself? The there's so many. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's why I had, I, so there's 10 lessons in the book. Okay. And um, yeah, the first one is um, history is full of people doing the impossible. So, you know, what is your current version of impossible and how do you make that happen? And for me at the time was writing a book. I'd mm -hmm. never written a book before. And so the idea of, of, of starting that, it did seem impossible. Yeah. And, and what were you know the steps along the way another big one for me was kind of um widening my definition of creativity um that creative thinking comes in so many ways and it's it's a way of living and it's something that we're all capable of it's not um It's not, oh, you're born creative or you're not creative. And I think so many of us think that, you know, we're not creative, <laughs> but we are. And every choice we make creates the life that we're living. Um, so we're creating every day, one way yeah. or another, um, either consciously ourselves yeah, or letting someone else create yeah. for us. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so, so that was a big eye opener for me, um, yeah. realizing lots of different ways that I was creating and, and that that power to create, um, the power to, to choose how we respond to a situation in life that we don't, we can't control everything that comes our way, but we can control the way that we respond to it. Mm. And that's what I could see in all of these veterans. It wasn't so much the stories themselves. I mean, they were moving in themselves, but what really touched me was the way I could see that their history And the events that had happened to them in their early 20s during the war had influenced the rest of their lives and the way they had responded or created a context around the content that had happened to them. And um, I realized that there's there's a freedom in that, that we there's there's an innate freedom that we we all hold within ourselves of, of deciding how we respond to any situation in life. Yes. I think very often it's not clear of us how much power we have actually of deciding what to do and how to do it. Mm -hmm. I think very often, and I can also refer to myself, you're in a certain context and you think there's a option. I have to act in a certain way yeah. while there are multiple options usually mm -hmm. to, to react or respond to it, but we are not conscious about it. Yeah, definitely. And there's, 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 a, there's a million different examples of how you know this has played out in history. Mm -hmm. um, I chose to talk about D-Day and Normandy because it's a place where I've been and it's a place where I continue to go with my family and and it's played a very important role in my life but someone else could take this these ideas and and, and put them in a totally different mm -hmm. context um, I think it's unusual that you don't normally see this in a historical context but um, uh, you know for me it's it's looking at what is the creative process that we go through when we need to achieve a goal and, and that how do what are the different steps of, of doing that when i started the book i said oh i'm writing about creativity and dj people yeah. looked at me you know completely yeah. cross-eyed yeah. but i think now they they're starting to understand yeah, it's not something about. that comes up uh, directly to your mind no yeah but on the other hand if you if you consider like in the, in the professional or business context they always talk about the vuca world mm -hmm. volatile and uncertain Yeah. And complex and ambiguous. I mean, 
what could be more VUCA than being on the landing boat going <laughs> to the beaches of Normandy and the bullets going well, right and left? Well, go right? back even earlier than that and being pushed off the European continent yeah. and then saying, we have to get back on the continent. Yeah. How are we going to do that? Yeah. And what's coming? And that's what that's where I see a lot of parallels in today's world and this idea that you know there were so many technological advances that happened during the war and especially that were developed for the Normandy landings. And, you know, looking at today's world and all of the different um, revolution, revolutions that are happening in um, artificial intelligence and, and, you know, we're facing a very unpredictable, um, unforeseeable future. And we're trying to position ourselves and say, you know, where do we have control? What can we, you know, what are the... What are those unique human qualities that we need to maintain and cultivate and we need to teach to our children and we need to make sure that we are cultivating in our employees? And if you go back and look at all the different steps of what made helped make the Normandy landings um, successful, you'll find all of those human traits of creativity, of empathy, of imagination, of creative problem solving, of being able to ask questions, you know, good questions that get good answers from them. Uh, those are things that artificial intelligence can't do for us, and we need to keep those going. And so I found it really interesting to say, look, you can take in a moment from the history, and you can see how they dealt with this unforeseeable future that they were in, and it can help us with our current challenges today. If you look at the generation of the veterans, they were like 18, 20, 22, and you compare them to us or people that mm -hmm. are now 20, 22, mm -hmm. don't you have sometimes the impression we are kind of chickens, you know, in, in a way that, I mean, they had so many, they, they were not asked if they would like to go to Normandy or the Germans were not asked very often no. if they would like to go to Russia. No. They just had to and they had to live with the circumstances and no. now we have... We are living in this highly technology safe environment and we are all afraid about artificial intelligence and, mm. and, and I don't know, losing the jobs or social security. And Yeah, but I like to think that we can rise to the, the occasion, mm. that we have the potential and if we were faced with a situation like that, we would be able to, yeah stand up for it and 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 i think that we see that i mean looking at the current um student marches and for climate change i think that that's that's so strong looking at the youth movement in the united states um lobbying for gun control you know they're standing up for something that is very important and 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 affects their daily lives and i think that yeah it's there we just haven't been necessarily asked um, the same way that the generation in World War Two, you know. Mm. So was. it was not required. So we didn't maybe have to stand up oh, that strongly. Our generation yeah. certainly hasn't had to. Mm. I mean, we we're, we're we're looking at seventy five years of peace in Europe, Western Europe for sure, um, uh, which is unheard of in history. So. Will it continue or not? I don't know. <laughs> but we've, we've, you and I have definitely are one of the generations that have been very lucky. Will our children be that lucky? I'm not sure. We'll see. Well, but hopefully they'll have a little bit more understanding of, um, yeah, what are the important things and, and ways to deal with challenges? Because whether we're in a war or not, we all are facing challenges every day. Um, challenges that do seem impossible mm. sometimes and and we have to make choices um, you know I, I I see so many people go to the beaches in Normandy and visit the sites and they're so moved by what they see and and, and they're just oh it's just so moving and I'd be like yes and you know what do you do with it how how is that going to change? And what you've seen now, how is it going to change your life on Monday morning when you go back to work, when you go back to school? Um, and so that's why I really, I wanted to write a book that would help people take that 
and apply it directly in their lives and everyday situations. And I'm not saying we all have to go out and fight wars. I hope that we don't. There are people that are still in, you know, wars continues around the world. So, um, but it's just a way of, of taking something from history and, and looking at how, how can it help us today? Because to me, that's, that's what matters. And if we, we, you know, so many people talk about, well, these younger generations today, they have, they're not going to have any connection with anyone who actually lived through the war because that generation is passing on. And, and how are we going to engage them? How are they going to feel like this is important to them? I think, well, the only way to do that is to show them how they can use this in their lives today. How is it relevant? Um, why is it important to know that? Yeah, I and that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, one of the main points you also make in the book is about the action. It's not only about the knowledge and understanding, but to put it into something concrete, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's why I, I start the book with you know the ten lessons, and then it becomes ten questions at the end of the book. And these questions are questions that you continue to ask yourself that um, throughout your life, because you're constantly changing. Um, it's funny as I was, you know, I spent um, a good four and a half years writing the book, and as as I would come to the end of it and I was reviewing it or rereading it to make sure things were correct, I think, oh, of course, why didn't I think of that? Oh my gosh, oh, I wrote that, you know, <laughs> because I was coming to it differently. I was facing a certain challenge in my life or something going on that day or that week, and then when I read, you know, part of the book, I think. Oh, yes, of course. Why didn't I think of that in this situation? So we're constantly changing and facing different things. And you're saying that actually freedom is not con not controlling the content of your life, but it's setting the context. But could you explain that a little bit? Well, yeah, that's what I talked about earlier. Is, you know, we can't we can't control all the things that happen to us in life. And sometimes, you know, but we can control the way that we respond to what happens to us in life and that's and that's where our freedom lies and there's a very poignant um, quote from Viktor Frankl who is a survivor of four concentration camps and went on to write um, a book called Man's Search for Meaning and he talks about that that our freedom lies within that ability to take a pause and to choose how we respond and mm -hmm. not just react to everything around us and so that's what that that lesson is is relating to yeah and then one of the lessons also was that you have to say or speak out what are your plans in a certain way or what you stand for mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so to in by 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 speaking it out somehow it, it materializes or it becomes a reality in a certain yeah. way you give you give it power in a certain yeah. way rather than keeping it inside of you and then you're like yeah yeah you're gonna do this i wanna go start with the gym you know you think about it every <laughs> week and you don't do it actually uh -huh. but if you have told 15 people or yeah. five people in your life you feel like you have to act on it right yeah there's there's a power in that in 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 writing down what we want to do and saying, declaring it out loud, and 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 committing to it in a way that, um, yeah, it's it 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 moves things within ourselves and uh, the people around us, and 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 so that's really important. And it's important to also talk about, you know, knowing what we stand for. What is um, what are the values that are important to us mm. in our lives? Because whenever we go out and pursue any impossible thing, it's going to be hard. And it's going to can require perseverance and dedication. And so if we know why we're doing it, because of certain values that we uphold, that will make it easier. And when we declare those values to others, it makes it possible for others to stand with us, hmm. to join us, to say, I too believe in that, or I support you. And, and, and that, you know, that, that also helps when we have other people to, to help us to work around us. Time. So. For you, after 25 years of research <laughs> and uh, writing a book and your personal experience, what for you is the biggest, if you had to name one biggest insight or one biggest hmm. thing you take out of all of that for yourself? I learned so many things over the process of writing this book about myself, about the way that I like to work, the way that I see things. 
um, the book is, it, most people, if you hold it up and show it, people can see that it's, um, we'll flip through the pages, you can see that it's visual, yeah. that there's a pay, there's a picture yes. on every page. Yeah, most people don't um, realize that. They think it's a book full of text. Mm. And um, what I learned for myself is what a visual thinker I am. Um, and how, you know, some, a lot of people said, oh, well, so you wrote the text and then you just found pictures to go with it. And I said, no, a lot of times the pictures themselves inspired the text that, you know, I was, I was constantly pouring through these databases of images and collecting images. And then I was writing the text and, and, and sometimes I'd be like, oh, but I really like that image. Why do I like that image? And then it would come to me and they would come together in a, in a way, um, and so, yeah, I, it, was, it was learning more about the way that I see and understand the world. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because, of course, in doing that, I, I look back at other projects I've done in the past, the things that I absolutely love to do, and realized, oh, I was doing that already earlier in my yeah. life, but I didn't pay attention to it because... I just thought, well, everybody thinks that way. You know, we're, we, we all, we're all in our own mind and we think that everyone else sees the world or, or thinks or functions in the same way we do because we don't, well, we don't realize what we're doing is something unique or different um, because it's just the way our minds work. And so, um, yeah, in doing the book, I, I realized, oh, there's something there that I... Um, that's special and that and it gives it a different approach than than yeah. what a lot of other people would do. So we all we are like snowflakes. We are all <laughs> snowflakes, but everybody of us, we are all different, right? Yeah, we all well, we all have something unique and and um, beautiful to bring to the world, and it's finding that confidence and finding the the the, the way to express it um, and share it with the world. Um, but also that we're all unique, but we're all human. We're all, mm. we have that common humanity within us. And I think that what, what really struck me over the years is that we, we all have a role to play in the creating our future history. And it's the choices that we're making each day, right now in our present, that is creating that that, that history that our children will be learning from. And so for me, the most important thing is it taught me is I, I have a choice, I have a role to play in what's going to, the stories that will be told later from myself, from my own life, from society, from what my children will remember about me, what they will learn from and what they will do. And, and that history is not, you know, that list of dates and, um, events in a dusty textbook. It's something that's living and it's something that we are creating. And so that's what I wanted most to teach my children and that I want readers to get out of the book is that we have that role, that sense of agency in, in, our, in our own history, yeah. in our own stories. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Erin. <laughs> that was very interesting. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Likewise, <laughs> and I invite you to have a look at her book or to, uh, well, commemorate the 75th anniversary of the landing this year. Yes, in June. In June again. Mm -hmm. And so thank you very much for listening to us. And I'm Sasha and I'm your coach.